Okay, so we're going to continue now with user interactivity and look at the specific nodes that we use to interact with a scene. So uh, uh, perhaps our most important one is uh, touch sensor. Most important because it's simple and often used. And then we have our plane sensor, cylinder sensor, sphere sensor. These nodes translate the up and down motion of a mouse or the left and right motion of a mouse into some change, some set of events in the scene. And I say mouse, but of course it's, as we learn in the concept section, it's any pointing device. And when we select an object and move the pointing device, when we drag, then that will change the up, down, left, right, Mickey Mouse motion of your pointer sensor and turn it into some kind of rotation or translation in the scene. Finally, we have keyboard input and two kinds of keyboard input. One is a key by key basis. The other is waiting for the user to enter a full string. And then uh, when sending the string, it deals with that. Most important is that our uh, interactive nodes our sensors are typically what initiate animation chains. We seldom use them as inputs for events. Uh, we, we don't modify them except perhaps to turn them off with the enabled field. But ordinarily these nodes are outputting events into the rest of the scene. Okay, so let's go to touch sensor. So the touch sensor uh, as with other sensor nodes, it affects its adjacent geometry. And by that I mean nodes in the scene graph. We have a group, then we have a touch sensor, and then we have a shape, and another group with other stuff, then it will affect all of that. But what it won't affect Are things out here, groups or transforms or whatever. Why? Because they are out of scope. The touch sensor scope is constrained to its peers and their children. Okay, so scoping is very important and even spellable. Let's see if I can get it here. And that's what we mean by adjacent geometry. Geometry that's in scope within the scene graph. Okay, now given that you have a pointing device and it's pointing at some geometry because the user has moved it there, then what happens? Well, first thing that happens is an is over event will be sent. Is over event true? when the mouse, when the pointing device is over it. So for example, if this were a 3D scene and this were some geometry I was interested in, then as soon as I move that mouse over there, then a true event is sent by the touch sensor node. Now it's sort of like a tree falls in the woods, does anybody hear it if there's nobody there to listen? Well, yes, the touch sensor will send an event if you allow it, but unless you route it, it won't go anywhere. Okay, so each of these implies that you've hooked up the sensor to a route because you care about that per particular event. And so, uh, so each of these needs a route if they're going to be used. Do you have to add a route for every little thing? Nope, nope, just the things you want, just for the animation chains that you want to trigger. Similarly, uh, if we then, now that the mouse is over it, if we select with our pointing device while it's over it, then a second true event is sent, and that's is active. Okay, so while we're once we initially select, that true event goes out, and then we're done, there are no more events, until we let go. And when we deselect, 
then a false event is sent. And when the pointer moves off the geometry, another false event is sent. So the first false event is, is active. The second false event is, is over. And you can imagine that there's two different ways this might happen. If the mouse and the pointing device is, is still over the geometry when deselecting, then you'll only get the single false event. If you then move off, that's when you get the is over false. However, if you clicked on it and dragged and moved the mouse off of the highlighted geometry, then when you let go, you'll get both of these guys at the same time because it's no longer active, you've deselected, and it's no longer over. It's, it's uh, pushed off. Okay, so two events, up to two events out, up to two events, excuse me, first one or two true events, and then one or two false events. Okay, if we think a little further about this and go, wow, couldn't there be some other combination? The answer is, well, no, not really, because if you're not over, then you can't select it. And if you can't select it, then you can't get an is active. All right, so in point of fact, we do get at least these two, and if selected, we'll get those two as well, but the order will be consistent. Okay, and whether they're used, is over, is active, is all up to whether you have a route for each to take care of it. You can't have two routes, you can't have one route for both, you can have one route for the is over and one route for the is active. They're separate things. Now, selection is pretty interesting. Uh, typically, if, if we say the mouse is typical, then when people use that, that's ordinarily the left button or the single button, depending on the mouse. And uh, if it's a laser pointer, usually there's a uh, button on it for selection. If uh, it's a touchpad or a touchscreen. Most touchpads and touchscreens uh, provide a button right next to it or, along, or at the bottom. Uh, you can check out your cell phone for that kind of thing. However, we do, we do give uh, uh, some alternates too. And for the keyboard, and uh, that's probably the most valuable one, by default, the enter key is the same as selection. And this can be very helpful if if, say, you're using a little stick pointer on, on a laptop and very carefully getting the, the pointer just right where you want it, then you might not want to jitter or shake it so that it falls off the, the tiny geometry you're selecting. You can go over to the enter. This is also uh, considered an accessibility feature where it makes, it makes it more accessible to people who might have difficulty with their devices for whatever reason. Okay, uh, what else? We talked about the grouping of the geometry. Here it is spelled out. And uh, of course, any geometry that is a peer or children a peer, of course, will have a shape over it. But for, you know, just writing it out for Eng plain English, we can say that, yeah, the geometry. Of course, so you still have to follow the rules for geometry. We can't suddenly magically start throwing around boxes and index face sets anywhere we want. Okay, so this is where you find yourself using grouping nodes, uh, perhaps more than ever, because you want to be very careful about where you put those guys to make sure that the right things are selectable and the wrong things are not selectable. Okay, so group as the parent is a way you would partition, separate geometry that you want it selectable or not. Okay, so uh, uh, often you'll have, if you want a very highly interactive scene, you'll have multiple sensors in there doing different things. Is over might be to help guide the end user into what the heck's happening, uh, whereas uh, actually selecting something will indicate, yes, they've made a choice, they've decided, they want to initiate an action, and then that's your trigger to get going. So uh, touch sensor is often used 
for uh, uh, user decisions, indicating a user decision. And then uh, that puts this node in the role of trigger value coming out. Either the uh, sometimes he is over, most likely the is active, since that's a deliberate decision to select where the is over might just be a random decision where the, ma the mouse or the pointing device happened to cross the geometry of interest, but that's because the user's looking around and deciding what to do and they haven't made a conscious selection yet of what they want. Okay. So if you want an example of this, we actually have one, and uh, we've gone through it already in Chapter 4, Finding Operations. And uh, uh, in that particular example, we were using uh, uh, both uh, viewpoints and touch sensors to kick things off. So here's a picture of that scene. Uh, and before we dissect this, why don't we pull it up and take a look at it? and run it again so it's uh, fresh in your mind. Oops. Let's get it back up here. This was the scene where we uh, carefully went through uh, all of the possible operations of when a node is bound and uh, looked at the binding stack for binding and unbinding. Okay, so if I click on this text, which helpfully tells me click to animate, then we see this sequence of operations occurring. So clearly, without even looking at the scene graph yet, we can tell that a uh, uh, touch sensor was used to uh, trigger an activity. So here's the scene, binding operations, it's in chapter four. Let's re-examine now what exactly happened there. And we'll do that by taking uh, a nice pretty version of the scene and marking it up. And in this case, I've gone ahead and used a X3D edit feature when we click on the minus sign in the, uh, in the margin, it turns to a plus and it will iconize that little uh, collection of nodes there. So this is how you can compress a scene and see lots of things all at once and, and examine the structure. So if I were to select any of those pluses, they would turn back to minuses and that transform would just get fully expanded again. So when it's compressed like this, this can be a good way to tell where is the scope of my sensor and where did the route go and am I doing the right thing? So we can see the event chain here just in the red arrows down at the bottom and sure enough there's our touch sensor that starts it all off and it connects to a time sensor which is the clock for animating this thing. The time sensor is driving a uh, integer sequencer which in turn is pushing a script. An integer sequencer is similar to an interpolator. We'll learn about it in chapter 9 but what it does instead of putting out continuous floating point numbers it puts out a sequence of integers one after another uh, at the interval you want so that you can use it to, for example, uh, uh, do selections among a script node or in our case we fed it to a script where the script logic decides uh, which viewpoint do I want to bind next. Scripts are also captured in, uh, covered in chapter 9. Okay, So this is a, remains a pretty interesting example from all the way back in chapter 4 we can see a lot more of what's happening here. And there are one or, two th one or two things with the integer sequencer, the script. We haven't covered yet, but I, th I think you can see the logical flow here. We can also see that uh, that touch sensor affects everything in the adjacent transform. And uh, 
fact, uh, it's not quite evident on here. Uh, maybe the blocks weren't right, but this transform where it starts is actually off the screen here and appears later in the scene. Is the close tag. So that's what shields this transform, this shape clickable from everything else above it. That transform is a grouping node and thus can uh, isolate it. Okay, why don't we... Uh, yes, question. Mm -hmm. that, well, the uh, the question is, how do we get to v.5, 6, 7, etc.? The logic of of how this guy works is embedded in uh, the script node. Obviously, from the behavior of it, we wanted to cycle among these four viewpoints. So we gave each of them a name so that we could bind them. And if we go down in here and look ahead and to say, what does a script node do? Well, uh, here's our script node. It is getting an input that's an integer. That's what's coming out of our integer sequencer. What does the integer sequencer look like? Well, let's pull that guy up. Uh, integer sequencer looks a lot like an interpolator. It has keys and it has key values. The only difference is that the key values are integers and their impulse values they're only sent once we don't in double interpolate between them but rather only send them once when the time comes for that value because uh, here's an example of a interesting conversation and uh, uh, a less interesting conversation if if uh, you ask me well how much money am I getting how many dollars are you gonna give me and I say five that's pretty interesting. But if I say, five, 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 oh, okay, okay, hold it. it. It's not so interesting, all right? So this is why integer sequencers only send it once. And this is why uh, that's a good thing for a one-time operation. Like, if you're bind to a viewpoint, you're bound to a viewpoint. You don't need to rebind, rebind, rebind to the viewpoint. It would be silly. So. There's a quick look ahead. The integer sequencer tickles our script, and then our script logic, okay, this is programming. And we haven't had to do much, if any, programming so far. But what it does is it says, I will look at that value when I get that input value, I will look at it, and I will switch. And if it's a value of zero, I'll bind one. If it's a value of one, I'll bind the next one. And so on. And print out some, some options. So uh, in our case, this is quite an involved example, the eight, nine, ten steps in here. And not all of them were binding a given viewpoint. We had four viewpoints. In fact, maybe I should call them viewpoints A through D instead of one through four because they're different steps. They're not always the same viewpoint on each step. But that's an example of we can write any logic we want in X3D. It's an example of if you want it to work, if you want to hear that tree fall in the forest, you do have to have a route for it. And then finally, coming full circle, way down here at the bottom of the scene, we see that closing transform which is what finished off the previous transform and what kept our sensor here. Pretty good. And that what our kept our touch sensor here from only affecting the shapes within that transform node. Okay, another question. So when you click on it, you get Touch sensor is accurate. It mm -hmm. Pops the system time. And system time sends a number to 
Yep, we use touch sensor as our trigger, which in this uh, uh, case is tickling an integer sequencer, which is pumping out a bunch of integers, which then goes to a script, and which then has lots of outputs depending on which step of the script you're on. And those typically are going to view one, view two, view three, or view four. Okay, so here we are, we're looking ahead at nodes we haven't even necessarily studied yet, and we're finding very consistent pattern, very logical approach to how all these things hang together. And for the node at hand, touch sensor, it's the trigger that makes all this work. Okay. Um, what else can we say about this? I think we covered it. That explains that. And then finally, uh, wanted to distinguish that the uh, you can't have multiple touch sensor nodes in a scene, and they will affect their own uh, specific geometry that they're next to. And so that's good. You can partition and isolate and script the whole behavior as somebody works their way through a scene and say get the appropriate reaction to each user action. But I uh, want to distinguish that these are not quite the same as a multi-touch sensor. And if you look at the notes for this, uh, it will have some details about that. And uh, Multi-touch is the notion that you can use two pointing devices at once and use special gestures. So this has been around for a few years, but hasn't come into widespread recognition until recently with iPhone and a few other devices where you can select with two pointing devices such as your fingers at once and by uh, some gesture for how you want to do it, you can expand or shrink or give a more expressive uh, command. We don't have that yet. It's not yet in X3D. Could it be? Sure. How do we know? Well, somebody's already done it. The Instant Reality team has uh, got some very interesting notes. They showed de demonstrations at the conferences this year, at the uh, VR conference and at the uh, SIGGRAPH conference. Very compelling. Uh, so if you want to use that right away, you could. You could use their browser and they've made extensions. We'll need a few other people to do it, to look at it, before we decide is it stable yet, sufficiently stable that we want to make it a first class citizen, a permanent citizen in the spec. We want to make sure that these are thoroughly sorted out. In the meantime, you know, vive la difference. It's great that uh, people are doing cool new things with X3D and testing out uh, how to push the envelope. Okay, drilling down into touch sensor, what else do we use it? Well, the, uh, perhaps uh, uh, there are a couple of uh, there are a couple of output events. The one we care about used most frequently is touch time, and touch time is the current timestamp, the current clock value, whenever you get uh, uh, a selection. Okay, so it's sent simultaneously. So when would you use? touch time versus is active, well, it depends uh, by the 10-step step process. Depends what input do you want. If you want a time value, such as set start time on a clock, on a time set, then you'd use touch time. If you want a true or false to enable or disable something, then you might use is active. So we list some uh, prerequisites here and uh, and when do you get a touch time? Well, the first touch time you get is for an is over, true. The second touch time you get is for uh, is active, true, meaning the user has selected the object. And then uh, uh, there's another case where, uh, where is active goes false because we've deselected, but we're still pointing at the geometry. So in a sense, we're still touching it. So it is curious that you have three times when you get to a touch time. 
This is why people don't use it as often as is active, because there are different modalities, different things the user might be doing. Are they touching it each time? Yes. Are we trying to react every single time? Probably not. We're probably only interested in the is active true when they've made the deliberate selection of it. Alternatively, we might only be interested in the is active false when they've made the deliberate deselection, perhaps pushing something into the place it needs to be. Okay, there's a few more points on here for uh, getting fancy. Hit point, hit normal, and hit texture coordinate. Given that you could be at a, you will be at a very specific point on the geometry when you touch it, this lets you find out exactly where was the user when they did that selection, when they hit it, when it became active. What was the point? What was the perpendicular, the normal to that point? What was the texture coordinate of the image draped over it? Those can all be helpful for advanced animation. Okay, and then we have uh, an example here with touch sensor triggering and uh, uh, to do this you would uh, touch and select the box and then we'll see the pump go up and down. Okay, uh, so when we pick up next time, we'll continue with touch sensor and we'll look at one more example, opening doors, and then we'll continue on with the other uh, drag sensor nodes, plane, cylinder, and sphere sensor.